Karen de la Carrière. Mm. Is that how we yes. say your name? Why did you, all those many years ago, join Scientology? Hmm, good question. I had a boyfriend who put his hands on my shoulders and said to me, you know what? You want a relationship with me? You got to get some Scientology counseling. It was an ultimatum, and I really liked this guy. He was a Brit called Barry Fairburn. And, you know, this all happened in London. And I thought, what? I, I want a relationship. <laughs> If he wants me to experiment with something, let's go. Uh, you got to know that Scientology was far more vanilla in the in the seventy. It wasn't didn't it always had its edge, it always had its undercurrents by the Guardian's office. But there was camaraderie going to a Scientology brick and mortar. I don't hate to call it a church. It's not even, <laughs> a brick and mortar, it was going to a country club. There's camaraderie and oh. fun, and you could say the snitching culture of reporting every word you say to the mother church. All of that started more and more in the 90s. And to that now, it's, it's, ooh, like a Stalin rush, you are going to report and snitch even on your husband, even on your kids. Everybody reports everything to the mother, mother church. And you're considered a mm. hero for doing it. Well, I guess that was the change in the 90s. We're talking about uh, David Miscavige really getting into things. So he was very different to L. Warren Hubbard, the, the, the founder of Scientology then, was he? He took the darker side of Hubbard and magnified and elevated it a hundred times. Once Scientology got religious tax exemption, Andrew, I want to make it very clear, the IRS cannot say what is a church and what is not a church. These are a bunch, they're not theologians. They know nothing. They're a bunch of CPAs, certified public accountants, CPAs and lawyers, that's, and clerks, that's the IRS. They're not, they're not trained in. So the Scientology spin is that the IRS, the government says we're a religion. Rubbish. Bollocks. They qualified for IRS tax exemption. That doesn't say you are a church. There's pages and pages, checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. They qualified for tax exemption, right? That's not yeah. the U.S. government saying they're a religion. I hate it to be called a religion. Eesh. I understand that. It's really interesting to hear you talk about it as a uh, like a yeah. club, like a, a club to go to. In the 70s, kind of thing. yeah. Um, yeah, although there was still a lot of abusive stuff going on, right? I mean, so tell me about your time on the Apollo and what the Apollo is for those people who aren't familiar with it. The Apollo was a, a ship used in World War II to transport cattle. And huh? it was called the Royal Scotman by accident and S was Royal Scotsman, plural, not, but it was painted Royal Scotsman. And Hubbard bought this to escape from England. The British Home Office would not give him permission to come back to England after. Mm. Now, why does the governments of the world, Andrew, answer me, why would a small cult bubble up to the level of government level? Governments are supposed to take care of your gross national product, your national security. They've got huge burdens on them. Why would they care? I'll tell you why. People who were so wrong and so abused would run to their local county council and run to their parliamentarian, and slowly it bubbled up. 
if Scientology didn't do gross things, there would be no, mm-hmm. there would be no government level action on them. Yes, for a small dying cult. But with that yeah. many complaints, I know for a fact that in the last couple of years, there have been 300 reports to the Department of Justice on Scientology malfeasance. IRS. What kinds of things? Kidnapped and held against will, not allowed to leave. Because mm. that's it's a felony to hold someone against will. The Sea Org do it all the time. They're terrified of escapees going to the media or being on shows with Andrew Gold. <laughs> or talking to... <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so being beaten as an employee, assault and battery, sleep deprivation. The CIA say that sleep deprivation is a form of torture. Uh, money ripped off to the point of bankruptcy on fraudulent, um, just fraud, fraud. You know that picture, Andrew, of the cross above the superpower building, there's a cross. Yeah. A friend yeah. of mine, one county south of Los Angeles County is called Orange County. A friend of mine mm-hmm. called Luis Garcia was extorted $40,000 for the cross. And he was told, this is your legacy. This is a monument long after you're dead and gone. Louis Garcia's cross will be up there through time and space. $40,000. And he'd already given huge mm. amounts and it was tight and he gave the 40000 Guess what? 30 or 40 other people were given the same pitch and they all paid 40000 for that one cross. Oh my God. Do that you see terrible. the scam and the con? Each of yeah, them were yeah. told, I can't believe your it. legacy, your monument that will last through time and space. Okay, that's the kind of complaint because they've got tax exemption and they've been granted this, they scream in the law courts, freedom of religion, religion. Yet they act like a bunch of yeah. religious mafia thugs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you say it was different back in those days. But when did you start to notice? Because it sounds like it was a social club in in some respect. And then when did you start to notice things were a little bit uh, awry? The Apollo was not a miserable time for me. But once we landed Mm -hmm. at the Fort Harrison, it became a statistical nightmare. Scientology graphs and statisized Everything Thursday, two o'clock to Thursday, two o'clock. That last week, you probably know much of this. And it's almost like Coca Cola. How many crates of Coke did you ship to Disney between that Thursday and this? This is a business. This is run like a business. In fact, the IRS in one of their memos <laughs> said to, said to the cult, if it swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, acts like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. And what the IRS was saying, yeah. you quack like a business. You statisize every piece of revenue you get like a business. You operate like a business. You give FSM mm. commissions. Is there any other church that gives someone money because they brought someone in i not that i know of mm. no well but but what what were you seeing back in the day did you see some of the abuses some of the physical abuses and things on the apollo no i did not i was locked away in an i was locked away in an auditing room remember i was not i was sitting down doing counseling with pcs but the word was out and i heard all about it Howard turned on a dark, dark side of management by punishment. 
And what he did with the earlier auditors, the, gener- the ones before me, is if they made an error, a minor error, they were thrown overboard, four stories down, into feces, into, you know, the ships have to outlet. They can't hold for two, three weeks excreter. And the, so these things float in the ocean till the ocean swallows them all up. And these trainees were thrown over the side of the ship. Some people couldn't swim. A very nice lady, I've got pictures of her to send you if you can think, called Julia Salomon, shadowed Hubbard in the 1950s. She worshipped him. She did er- She was a kind of accountant. She did accounting for him. She And she came to this class on the Apollo. She was 58 years old, and she couldn't swim. And she was hurled overboard, screaming all the way down to the ocean. And they sent some divers to retrieve her because she would have drowned. The next day, she packed, and she was gone from Scientology forever. That was it. At least she was able to escape. Well, she was saved from drowning. So, but it's also escape from Scientology. Yes. So all of these stories abounded in the Apollo. A ship, news travels fast. And there was a punitive side of Hubbard where he wanted to jolt the person with such shock, such an explosion in their mind that they wouldn't dare do that error again. His <laughs> His theory was you shock them into obedience. That was the darker side of Hubbard. You worked quite <laughs> you worked quite closely with him. Um I, I'm told I mean he's almost obviously for Scientology he takes on a mythical persona, but for the rest of us he almost does as well because it's the closest thing to a kind of modern day deity of a religion, despite all the falsehoods and the phoniness. I've heard it said that he he had particularly noticeably bad teeth and smelled bad. Was no, that your he experience? He didn't smell bad. He was fanatical about hygiene. He was. Oh. He really was. And that's why nobody could understand that his dead body had unkempt fingernails that hadn't been manicured or kept. They couldn't understand that. Even his children, Suzette, it's just 180 degrees opposite of... No, Hubbard was fanatical about hygiene. He had a whole team of household to do nothing but endlessly clean his quarters. Did you know that he wouldn't wear a shirt unless it had been through eight laundry cycles? Eight times that same shirt had to go through eight laundry machines. That's how it's almost obsess. He had an obsession against germs and bacteria. So no, he was clean, but his teeth, that was because he hated dentists and he hated doctors. And he had a high level of suspicion that they could be implanters. An implanter is somebody that drugs you or anesthetizes you with anesthesia and then plants hidden commands I'm- into your mind. Andrew, I'll tell you, when I was summoned by David Miscavige to the base, the int base, the hierarchy, I had been stellar. I was sent all over the world on planes to talk about Hubbard's anecdotes and stories and to pitch the famous top L's, L10, L11, L12. These are a hundred thousand dollar rundown, spiritual run. And I was known. I was just a known presence. Then I married the president of the Church of Scientology Internet. I became even more known, but I was mostly known as the class 12 trained by Hubbard. Do you know that when David Miscavige summoned me to the base, they were doing what's called security checks, interrogation, and their line of questioning was, 
when you went to the dentist, did you ever go unconscious and get subliminal commands? Now, I was as loyal as they come at the time. I was just completely, utterly a gung-ho Sea Org member. But this was Hubbard. Hubbard had died, but the question was, did a dentist give you amnesia and tell you to destroy Scientology? Or have you been given commands to so destroy bizarre. David Miscavige? <laughs> This is, this is what happens behind curtains. The most trusted person, because you're asking to leave, the psychiatrist must have implanted you. Only you would not want to leave because it's hell on earth now. It's become punitive. It's, you just can't stand it. No. Psychiatrists. How did you, let me know, how did you mind. end up, um, <laughs> Is it Heber, your ex-husband? Is that how you, Heber? How, he was the Heber Gensch, the international president. So is that like, does Scientology Heber. have a bit like France? It's like a president and a prime minister. Uh, or what, What's the deal there? David Miscavige has total power. These titles are fluff and frog. Mm. But Heber was the international spokesman with the title of president. He was more a PR uh it was a PR job, but he was everywhere in the 70s. He was on 60 Minutes, Larry, I mean, just any big show, NBC, CBS, any show that demanded answers of Scientology, he I was see. the spokesman. I see. Then he was replaced by Mike Rinder. Mm, Mike, that's Mike, Mike, who's been Mike Rinder on this show. Stepped. Go on, sorry. Oh, Mike is a dear friend. We've We've traveled together for 40 years. <laughs> Mike is, and we were on the Apollo together and stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with Mike's show. And, and Mike is absolutely right. Hubbard was bigger than life. He, he was like a, the Pied Piper of Hamlet. He was so, people just followed, followed, followed the Piper. He could tell you stories and just blow you away. He was, he also had, strangely enough, even though he had a brutal side, he had a very high level of affinity. And when you were with Hubbard, he would make you feel you were the only person in the world and that the sun rose and set with you. And there was only you and him. No one else existed. He had this hypnotic, magical, way of treating you with <laughs> and when you walked away people would always say my god i'm floating on air i just had five minutes with Howard one on one and i can't even come down to earth that's how people felt after a few minutes with him is that how you felt i did feel very very good at the time yes yes hmm and then your sort of life with Heber Gensch, and I mean, how were you involved? And were you excited to see him going on these TV shows and, and promoting Scientology? I got promoted to be his assistant. So I was involved in actually, you know, this behind the scene production. I actually dreaded it because after the show, Miscavige was you didn't talk enough about psychiatry. Your voice was wrong with this. And then he would get what's called cramming orders. Cramming orders are orders for you to go back and study and get yourself back indoctrinated in what Hubbard said to do. You know, Hubbard called all reporters and journalists on the equivalent of per perverts on the equivalent of homosexuals. They were called 1-1. One, 1-1 one. One, one is a tone level of covert hostility. 
So where Heber would get trashed after every show, Miscavige would humiliate him and crush him. So anytime he had a show, I already knew the aftermath was punishment. So Heber. Mm-hmm. Oh, and did you uh, love Heber very much? I did. I've never said one thing ever derogatory about him in all the hundreds of shows I've done, videos and stuff. And he was never said anything derogatory about me. Uh, did did you leave? Did you did you leave together? The um, Scientology. Oh no, he would never left. He's still he's in the pr- in prison there. He, he's still there. Oh yeah, he were he were never left. He was still in. However, he's an old old man with memory issues and. You know, just really just sort of the onset of Alzheimer's and his health is really bad. David Miscavige doesn't like people dying on the property. It's police co- media. So he was in some kind, he has been shoved off Scientology property into one of those, not quite a hospice, but a kind of rest home. People ask me all the time, all the time, what's the news on Heber? Where is Heber? Heber was a household name. So this is the update. This is the update rarely known by anyone. He's in some kind of rest home in the San Bernardino County area in kind of proximity to the int base. I would say within half an hour to a one-hour drive. Mm-hmm. I see. And how are you aware of that? Are you still in touch? Leaks. No, no, no. He can't talk to me. I'm a, I'm, <laughs> I'm one of the top 10 enemies. I speak out. I, <laughs> so, Heba. so with these leaks, then I suppose David Miscavige in a sense is right to be paranoid. Um, cause he's, thinks that, you know, everybody's after him all the time, as L. Ron Hubbard did. Yes. So there must be people who are still Scientologists, who are still working in Scientology and I suppose are devoted to the cause, but who are also leaking information. Yes, yes there are insiders leaking. Mm-hmm. Mm. Why do you think they do that? They themselves are trapped. They would lose their, they would never be able to talk to their husband again. They would never be able to talk to their kids. There's this emotional blackmail if you dare to walk out. So they don't feel mm. they can depart. But the least they can do is okay. give, like, throw a little tidbit here or there. Mm. Okay. So they're no longer uh, probably devoted to the cause. They're, they're sort of fallen angels in that respect. They're resigned. Want to leave in there. They're resigned. Yeah. Uh, who knows, Andrew? Yeah. There's all different motives. There's not one blather i can give you one blob all leaks are because of people have different you know different Mm -hmm. motives yeah you spoke in your your emails to me or you wrote in your emails about your your son what are you able to tell me about that alex about what happened to him yeah heber and i had a child who was born and raised in the sea org and he grew up, and as a young man, his wife and him, his wife got pregnant, and she was coerced to abort, and she did. But she had an incredible emotional turmoil, upset over, she wanted to be a mom, to be a mom, and she killed the baby. Time rolls forward a few more months. Oh, and, and when she was pregnant, she has <laughs> managed to clean and swab gallery scum and dishes 12 hours a day standing on her feet as punishment for being pregnant. This is how the cult treats pregnant women behind the scenes. Have you ever done Claire Headley yet? You've done Mark. I haven't spoken to her yet. I, I've spoken with Mark. I'll, I'm, I'm getting rounds to everybody. Yes, you are doing the rounds. It's fabulous, Andrew. Yes. You really are doing something 
beyond being a good host and journalist, you're helping <laughs> putting the truth out there. Claire will tell oh, you the punishments you. she got when she was pregnant. Claire be a master at that. Anyway, um, she got pregnant again. Andrea is her name. And by now, the internet is alive, revealing coerced abortions. It's just made major media. So the cult is a little more trepidatious of forcing abortions. And they gave Alexander right. and Andrea the opportunity to go and work outside or to route, what they call route out, leave. And Andrea and Alexander did. Now, instead of Alexander coming to live with me in my huge home with lots of guest rooms, the cult sent him off to Dallas Fort Worth with Andrea to work for a wealthy Scientologist. I was speaking out. They found, oh my God, if Alexander starts talking about what happens inside to his mom. So they siphoned him off to his death because he got ill. He got raging temperatures. No no medical diagnosis. So he took opioids. He took, he, he, the autopsy said a $20 antibiotic could have saved his life. $20 could have saved his life. But he didn't take any antibiotics. He took, he took, oh, opioids are a derivative of heroin. But these were prescription. He wasn't doing street drugs or anything. And hmm. he lived with his in-laws, Andre's parents. And he had a raging temperature. The next day, after a day and a half, he was unresponsive. And the guy there took his kid to school before calling 911, you always wonder if he could have been revived or given, you know. It, it, it he did what? He took his kid school to school before, while... Hmm, while the, the Alexander was unresponsive. That's insane. It is. It is. And then... And was was he a Scientologist? Was, that, was there a family Scientologist? Absolutely. Die hard. Really. And he was the head of CCHR, this maniacal group that attack psychiatry, that want to destroy science. Their, their, their mission is to destroy Scientology. Would you say this is a case that's not too dissimilar to that of Lisa McPherson in that, you know, some medical help, yes. although there was more of a psychological aspect perhaps at play with Lisa, yes. some medical help would have, and they didn't want to because it's against Scientology rules? No, not so much that... Um, he was reporting weekly. He was still the son of the president. So he was reporting weekly to his OSA handler. And with all their billion dollar, three billion, with all their money, they wouldn't pay for him to have a full medical diagnosis. But here's Andrew. They cut him off from I could have had him have a full workup medically. They would not let him talk to his mom. This is where Scientology has blood on their hands. They feared what you might say or what you might learn from him or something. Well, I was, uh, I was right out and about doing my videos, and doing media interviews. And anyway, when he, so, so basically he took opioids, he died. They didn't resuscitate. There was no resuscitation because he, <laughs> by the time he took his kid to school and called Office of Special Affairs, the, the spy division of the, the cult that does all the fair game. Osa. By the, Osa. Yeah, yeah, well informed. By the time they did all mm. that, the paramedics came, he was totally dead. And it went viral, Andrew. The Daily Mail. Day 
after day after day. Son of the president died of opioid, blah, blah, blah. They interviewed me. They flew journalists to interview me. And then because of the Daily Mail, every other media from Australia to South Africa, it went viral how this little boy who had done three purification rundowns, this is the detox of the cult, mm -hmm. three he had done. He died at 27 of opioids, drugs, which you're supposed to end up after you've done the cult's detox to have an aversion to drugs. You've gotten wise that drugs are deadly and can kill you. There he died of drugs, and the media made a huge thing. This was in 2012. He died on July 3rd, 2012. So we're looking at a decade now. And I, it was a fork in the road. I could either curl up in a ball and just be in misery and or I could stand up and reveal. Actually, that precipitated my YouTube channel. The whole reason I started on YouTube was the death of Alexander. I thought, I'm not going to let his death be in vain. I'm going to let other mothers know what can happen when you raise your child in a cult. And you're in, you know, I, so I told lots of stories. Mm -hmm. How, how does it feel? to talk about Alexander now? I think it is true that time is a healer, but I've taken that energy of enormous grief and I've, I've used that energy to really disclose and do good things by educating information so much information that it could be comprised into knowledge, knowledge about mm. the cult. And squeezing that and, co and, and compressing that down into wisdom. <laughs> so mothers write to me from all over the world and call and say, Karen, I watched one of your videos. My 14-year-old was just about to go in the Sea Orc. And I watched two, three of you, you, you changed the trajectory of our entire family. I get this every week, every week. Huh. Somebody's just thanking me from their heart of the disclosures I've done. And that keeps me going. Yeah. Well, you need, after, you know, the death of a son, you need something to yes. keep you going. Because it, I, I can't imagine how difficult that was for you at the time. Oh, Andrew. And, but I have myself to blame. I brought him and had a child within the cult. I don't think I've ever forgiven myself completely. I have to look at what did I do? And the finger points, the buck stops here. I don't know. I, I feel like that's what Scientology would want you to think. I think they say that you pulled it in. Well, I, right? I don't, pulled it in is what they call your motivator. You've done something bad to someone, you're going to pull it. You punch someone in the eye, what you're going to pull in is a black eye from someone else. That's the pulling in of it. I look at this from a cause viewpoint. I was a cause factor in this, not pulling in anything. I made choices in my life. I wasn't a second generation like, like Chris Shelton and, and Aaron Smith. I wasn't. I chose to do cult doctrines. But you didn't know. You didn't know that this, you know, the amount of things we do in our lives where we don't know. And you, I believe, were a victim of, of, a cult and and so was your son unfortunately how did you leave the cult i just wandered off and they begged me they begged me to come back and get counseling letters from 
commanding officer, this just... Then I had visits from Osa saying, Karen, you're talking to Mike Rinder and Marty, and this is your final, final warning. You're going to, if you don't, if you don't wake up, you're going to be declared. And I said, how do you know I'm talking to Mike How do you know Mike Rinder's oh in God. Florida? I'm in Los Angeles. Marty's in Texas. And he was evasive. This was a guy in intelligence. And he said, we, well, we have private investigation. I said, you're stealing my phone records, aren't you? You're stealing, because the only way they could know of these. And oh, my God. They were stealing phone records. And when I called up, at that time I had AT&T, and I called them up and I said, they're stealing my phone records. They know who I've talked And they elevated me to a supervisor. <laughs> the supervisor said, when we find out who's doing this to the records, we fire them on the spot. They're admitting they've got stuff that sell the record because they then fire them. But that means it is yeah. happening because they get fired. Yeah. So yeah. I switched. What can you do if they've got m moles everywhere? You know? Well, Andrew, their claws are so, so much down to the bone. Just they are not the vicious, horrible monster. Now, they do go after Mike Rinder viciously and Leah Remini, but I think they're only focusing on those that Aaron Levin would be, Aaron Smith Levin would be not even attacking Chris Shelton. And he does a couple of two, three videos a week, right? Yeah. I do one video every yeah. other week, if that, one a month sometimes. So I'm on There's the- There's too many now. Pardon? There's too many people speaking yes. out yeah. now. A lot, a lot of voices. Yes. Mm. So they can't, they can't possibly monitor everybody. They don't have the resources. Besides, every single time they do something, it let me give you an example. Aaron Smith <laughs> yeah. Levin was running for councilman in Clearwater. And it looked good. I thought, oh, he'd be, he'd be able to, you know, they're such a major person in Clearwater. But Scientology moved sun, moon, and stars to block him from being a counselor. Oh, are they pulled out? They used everywhere. There was no, the budget was unlimited to, to stop Eric. Now, look at Eric. If they had been a councilman, he would have been, he wouldn't not, he, he would not have even been allowed to do three videos a day with 60,000 views a day. They blocked him being, what is a, a councilman has a little bit of power, but he's a big fish only in a little pond, the little pond of Clearwater. Yeah. Clearwater is off the, the main, it's not in New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, it's, and he would have been a little councilman, but they, they blocked that. And now, Aaron is just fire. <laughs> they. Yeah. He's like the biggest, the biggest person speaking out against them right now. now. He just, he's unstoppable, that man. Right now, he is it. And they, by blocking him being the big fish in the little pond mm -hmm. of Clearwater, Look what they got. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of the Streisand effect. Are you familiar oh, with the Streisand very effect? Very much so. Very much so. Yes. <laughs> when I uh, just, for anyone who isn't, just for, yes. for they, she didn't want her uh, house to be in the papers. So I think she sued or she complained. And because of that complaint, loads more people saw her house. So it's that thing. And I think Scientology have over and over again embarrassed themselves by going after people who, <laughs> uh, you know, who were maybe not going to make such a big problem for them and because they went after them they made it into a much bigger problem they know now like for example that if they came you know knocking on my door 
well, I'm just going to make a video about <laughs> it and it's going to get a lot of views. It's only going to help. Um, and they make these ridiculous websites that everybody knows is fake anyway about people, all these claims they make. So it's just ridiculous. Um, one of the faces of this cult still, and we, we talked um, beforehand a little bit about this, is Tom Cruise. And you've got some inside information about... Because you sent me um, that... There was that clip that went a bit viral recently where he was screaming at crew members uh, around the whole COVID thing. Um, but mm. it sounds like what, from what you're telling me, that's quite typical of his uh, behavior. That is, that is David Miscavige. He's aping and echoing. A guy called John Brousseau interviewed with Tony Ortega and said, Tom Cruise regards David Miscavige as a god. This is a very close in the inner sanctum guy who told Tony Ortega this, he somehow, that Pied Piper Rasputin yeah. thing, remember the Russian that could Rasputin? There's this hypnotic effect somehow. Well, Miscavige has always given Tom Cruise platinum card treatment. He doesn't, he's never done one day in the RPF, the prison grounds. Well, he's never, <laughs> he's never. He's been treated like Saudi royalty. There is absolutely nothing yeah. the cult won't do because they want his name there. One day, Tom Cruise voiced a fantasy when he was courting Nicole and said, you know, I just love to walk through the wilderness, have wild flowers, like a calendar, sh you know, just, just fantasy. Well, Sea Org members got sleep deprivation and were up all night planting wild flowers all across where Tom Cruise, out of his luxury abode at a <gasps> base, could walk. But guess what? They planted the wrong flowers. They weren't daisies. So they had to stay up even longer, no sleep, uproot all the wrong flowers and then plant the right flowers. And Tom didn't know. How many people got no sleep, no, just to pamper him for a few <laughs> seconds to hold Nicole's hand and walk through the daisies. When I say he got platinum gold treatment, there is nothing that Tom ever experiences. But you know, there's no excuse. The internet has hundreds of videos on the darker side. Is he... See no evil, speak no evil, hear no Well, that, that, that's the question, isn't it? That I think that's the question everybody wants to know about Tom Cruise. I think we've come to the conclusion he is a true believer. He's not just somebody faking it because he gets advantages and things. But is he, as you, you yes. know, that example you just gave, uh, he didn't know. So is he just a bit dim, <laughs> you know, just doesn't quite, oh, flowers for me, how fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Shaking everyone's hand, big hugs and stuff or is it just that he doesn't care uh, that people are getting sleep deprivation because he thinks it's part of the cause uh, you know is he a psychopath or, or an idiot or both <laughs> you ask great questions andrew you ask great questions god you're good <laughs> um, so are you he's been hmm. indoctrinated that there are robotic degraded beings all around and these degraded beings attack you. And so he's already been completely indoctrinated. Well, it's always the way, isn't it? That's a red flag immediately. Anybody who thinks that they're wonderful they're probably isn't. Bitter people with an axe to grind. They have crimes. They left Scientology because they were criminals and couldn't live up to the ethical standards of the Nopsa. <laughs> Sounds unbelievable because they yeah. dub themselves the most ethical group on the planet. That's a slogan. Well, it's I always think. the way, isn't it? That's a red flag yeah. immediately. Anybody who thinks that they're wonderful probably isn't. Because he got indoctrinated in violence and punching these degraded beings, yeah. degraded beings, he was doing that to his own staff. 
That's right. Scientology. Yeah, because you t- you were telling me this earlier, like off camera, and I was I'm a bit shocked by it because I'd heard f- just for by way of example quite a few things that he sent his niece away because she'd kissed a boy or something. She had to like live away from the family for years. That uh, that he'd uh, made Scientology find a girlfriend for him, and when they found one, she offended him by accident, so he made her clean the bathroom with a toothbrush. Uh, Nazanin Bonyadi, that is the actress before Katie Holmes. Mm. So you hear all these things, but I hadn't yet heard uh, that he'd physically attacked people. But my my understanding, I mean, you mentioned Michael Dovan, his PA. PA. Yes, Mike Dovan. Dovan, yeah. Yeah. Scientology plants staff members into Tom's household that report to David Miscavige. They're spies. They're t- Tom Cruise lives with only loyal sign, loyal to David Miscavige, not loyal to Tom, and they report just punching people on Tom to Miscavige. One of the staff Scientology planted that was trusted was Michael Dovan, and he was beaten and shoved and punched by Tom. You know, Tom Cruise even by Tom Tom Cruise just punching people would do assault and battery on his own staff repeatedly. Repeatedly. Not, you know, once a year he lost it or something. That clip that you just referred Mm. to, that clip, yeah, you can see how he can lose it. Yes. He can't keep his cool. um, Yeah. With with regards to the... the as opposed just quickly, just with regards to the physical stuff, do we need to insert the word allegedly here? Because I, th- I guess that's what we're all wondering. And I guess we all wonder this with all the stories about Tom Cruise and the violence and the anger and stuff. We obviously know that clip that you referred to because that happened and we heard him screaming at his cast. Mm. Uh, mm. But 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 how sure are we that, these, that, that he did use his fists in anger against his staff? Well, I can send you texts. I think it was covered in mm-hmm. Going Clear, but... The cult has never challenged it or tried to run to a court and say, we want to have a temporary restraining order on this public, you know, stop this, this is lies, or sued for libel. And it's been on the web repeatedly, but there's Hmm. no pushback or denial. Yeah, but that would be a Streisand effect again, Michael wouldn't Dovan it? If he came forward saying, said, we'd all be like, this he did all what? Because 99% of people, I worked for Tom for I, I years. a lot of people watching this video him. now it would who are not familiar with for him to... Yeah, but that would be a Streisand effect again, wouldn't it? If he came forward saying, we'd all be like, he did what? Because 99% of people, I, I bet a lot of people watching this video now who are not familiar with all the Scientology stuff would be going, what? Mm. The guy from Minority okay, Reports and okay. a, a Few Good Men, he did what? Um, yeah. So that's no, the only continue. thing we just have to, I guess we should say allegedly, and there was allegedly, a woman was, was thrown against a file yes. cabinet. That's one of the other yes. Um, allegations. Yes. Yes. By him. He does lose his temper in that clip. It's an audio clip. For anyone who hasn't heard it, it's all over the internet. Um, and it's during the COVID times and two people were not standing close enough. Oh, they were standing too close. They were within two meters of one another. And he really loses his temper. And it reminds me of a time that I got shouted at when I was in a pub uh, because I was eating McDonald's. I had, I had just, a, just a McFlurry and you weren't supposed to bring food in there. Mm. And this guy in front of like all my friends, who was the pub owner, berated me. But it just felt like the first few seconds, okay, that was enough. Okay, And I was like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be eating it. He went on for minutes and that's when you go like this is a humiliation. You don't. You should. Ne- There's no reason ever. I don't think to shout at someone for long. I mean, probably ever. But if you do shout at someone, you really lose your temper. This should be a few seconds. And this is a three minute tantrum where he cannot control himself. And as you say, that's quite shameful for him because the whole point of the whole Scientology thing and how intense he is is that he can control himself, but he can't. If you've been doing Scientology for years and years, surely you would know to at least keep your manners in and keep your keep your cool you can't lose your cool now here's the thing people go on 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 endlessly oh tom cruise isn't that john travolta in 35 years they haven't gotten one other a-lister it's only 
sorry I keep hitting. It's only Cruz and Travolta. That's it. There's not one other A-lister that they've been able to get in. Cruz no. and Travolta is old. That goes back like 40 years. The big question is, come. They haven't gotten in anyone else. I'll tell you why. Scientology is career suicide in Hollywood. Hmm. Absolutely. Tom's doing all right. Well, he he survived. He got a real good movie, and he did really that movie is no no one can deny something there. But for up and coming people who try to, it, you know, you know what Scientology does. Hollywood is full of. Auditions. People line up long lines in certain streets, hoping to make it in Hollywood, an audition. And Scientology Celebrity Center staff go there and give out flyers to all the people in line. We can make you the next Tom Cruise. We can make you as if they created. Tom Cruise had natural talent, has obviously some talent there, no? He's Oh, yeah. So, so the deception is to rip off these poor, innocent, good looking babes and men who've come in thinking, oh, I'll make a breakthrough in Hollywood. And that's how Celebrity Center get their public. They, they mm. are, they are shanghaied off these waiting lines for auditions by mm. leaflets and come for a free seminar. We can guide you. We can make your career. We're specialists in celebrity handling. That's yeah. The, that's I, the, I suppose the the closest they've had otherwise, aside from John Travolta and Tom Cruise, was Leah Remini, Leah uh, Remini. from King of mm-hmm. King of Queens, um, yes. and Kirstie She's- Alley, um, and uh, Lisa Marie Presley, I think, and Nancy Cartwright. You don't hear much about her. The the voice of Lisa Simpson or Bart Simpson as, as well. Well, she's not an A-lister. Uh, no, none of them are. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know. Lisa Marie left 10 years before she died. 10 years before she died. And she said they were taking everything. My money, my soul, my life. So at least she got out before, you know, before yeah. she passed. Yeah. And Leah Remini, good that she's out as well. And oh. doing great, great work. Oh, she's, she's top of the line. Yeah. She's cool. Tell me about, um, just while on, on the Tom Cruise stuff, right? There's a, there's a story about a drinking glass chip. And there's also a story there's about Tommy Davis, who's the guy you see on like, some of the documentaries shouting and stuff. Tommy Davis. You said there was a there was a drinking glass chip that like Tom Cruise complained about his glass being chipped. I I know I sent you some excerpts I got. I'm not can you give me a little more data on the Tommy Davis aspect of that? Oh, just I think you said that he he they're two separate stories, I think. One is about the the broken chip, the chip glass, and Tom Cruise apparently had a bit of a hissy fit about it. And the other is that he was quite uh, abusive with Tommy Davis. Well, he's learned to be abusive to one and all. This is David Miscavige indoctrination. David yeah. Miscavige feels he's like a street pug. This is a guy who didn't even have a GED. He <laughs> he rose to power, and you know the old saying by that British statesman, absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> Miscavige, drunk with power, drunk with power. He can look at someone, and the next 10 years of their life can be changed when David Miscavige says you're going to you're going to the prison camp RPF just like that, and so David Miscavige is the absolute power, and he has fed Tom Cruise on how to act because the world is full of these second third class citizens. 
There's different names for them. Degraded beings, he calls. He calls. And Tom Cruise famously told Naz, Naz, we call her Boniani, the, the girl chosen to be his girlfriend. Yeah. He said, first there is Hubbard, then there is David Miscavige, and then there is me. Tom Cruise voiced himself as third in the hierarchy, and David Miscavige validated this by telling the world and telling his staff, he is the most dedicated Scientologist that I know. This was a slap in the face to CO members working 60, 60, 80 hour weeks with no day off, little to no pay. But Tom, who made movies, and then <laughs> was the most loyal Scientologist. No, they have a bizarre relationship. This is, it's unnatural. This, this is a real, the Tom Cruise, David Miscavige bond is sort of, a, it's, it's a mystery, and it's beyond. I mean, this is Hollywood, Hollywood movie star and a guru of, of a vile cult. And these two are bonded, bonded. And there's nothing Miscavige won't do to pamper and give royal prince treatment to Tom Cruise. I feel like there's more to come out in the next decade or two about all of that. I, I you know, the, we wait with a bated breath. Bated breath? What mm -hmm. is that expression? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Karen, where can people find your channel and find all your work exposing this vile cult? Well, my channel is called Surviving Scientology. But Andrew, you haven't asked me why. Why would Tom Cruise fall for them? I thought that was the, one of the most because I'm technically trained in all of these things. You haven't, you haven't asked why. Hmm. Why, Karen, <laughs> do you think Tom Cruise <laughs> fell for this? In the early parts of Scientology, you can get a big win. It's false to say the entire package of all of Scientology is bullshit, because that doesn't explain anything. Why would they have even, who would be giving them multi-million dollars? Why are people that dedicated and that loyal? It has something. The something is in the lowest levels. Not the sci-fi, you've got 400 million attached spirits glued to you. None of, none of all that. The low levels, lowest levels. In a counseling session, you're in a bubble. There's only you and the counselor. And the probing questions you're asked can give you a relief that's something that becomes addictive. You want more of that. You suddenly almost go out of the time stream. You get the super conscious awareness. Now, people do it all the time by drugs, horrible drugs there. There are drugs, Asha Koswa, I don't know how to pronounce this. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, ayahuasca. Even Prince Harry lately was saying, yes. oh, I only handle my trauma because of the drugs. Well, I'm telling you, Scientology counseling can give you these highs. It's high, but it's drugless. You suddenly go, goodness. That's why I blah, blah, blah. And you just, all your mental clouds and mass fade off. Now, here's the con of Scientology. These big happinesses are only transient. They do not pass the test of time. You might be happy for half an hour, maybe it lasts two days, three days, but then you crash and burn. Scientologists that give them $1 million and do everything, they will get cancer like anybody else, and they will die off at 
55 years old, like anyone in the general population that didn't do all the procedures. They will go home and their wife will divorce them and be playing around and cheating on them, just like anyone in the general population. So the lies of Scientology are promising you this superman, super okay. Give us your money and we will make you above and beyond normal homo sapien. That is the con. There's no question that you get some big highs, but the high is what makes people hooked. Look, if you went to a casino in Vegas and you roll some dice and you won a million dollars, the casino laughs because you're going to give that back. You got such a high making a million dollars in 30 seconds. You believe this can happen again. Or oh, you want that high. So you repeat, you go back to Vegas and slowly you're dribbling away the million that you, you go back. But what you're looking for is that exquisite feeling of invincibility, of feeling wealthy, of feeling happy, of feeling Scientology will give you that. And that's what hooks people thinking. Well, let me do the next level. Maybe I'll get back that, that super, super exquisite feeling. So people keep going. Hubbard yeah. said people will do a lot of things. And spend a lot of money for a little piece of pleasure. And that's true. People will bankrupt themselves. They will just to get that high. Highs are addictive. And no question that Scientology, I mean, some of these questions are very clever. Let, let me give you a couple of sample questions. Yeah. What is the worst thing that another person ever did to you in your whole life i'm trying to think yeah yeah no no but this is all counseling this is counseling right well suppose i say uh my uh, uh my girlfriend left me at the altar good now starts the procedures to handle that extreme loss and scientology has good techniques because that's loss and mm. betrayal and Scientology can zoom into that. Then there's the other side of the coin. What is the worst thing you ever did to another person? But in Scientology, it doesn't say this lifetime. It says, what is the worst thing you ever did to oh. another? On the whole track, it opens mm. up. There's no time limit. So people go right back. I was in the Tower of London and my head got lopped <laughs> off. So... So, uh, you know, the questions are not gobbledygook. Here's another one. Here's another one. What lie have you been made to believe? Hmm. And you think of uh. all the propaganda you've swallowed over them. What lie have you made another person believe? So I'm giving you sample questions that make you think and you think oh my god howard's a genius nobody ever thought of sitting me down and going right into my soul to find out things who or what has regarded you as an enemy this is a scientology mm. question so fascinating it will open up and you can get highs so if you want to ask why tom got Tom had a couple of what we call ascensions. An ascension means you lift off your daily headaches and all the trials and tribulations and frustrations, and you reach a place of exquisite just feelings so darn good. And that's the moment of addiction. Now, I did all addictive. these procedures for years, morning, noon, and night. And I know everything that can go wrong and everything. But the, the high 
is no longer lasting than Askawasa or <laughs> ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. So you you get something that yeah. Join me on the edge for new episodes every week. Start watching right now.